was a magazine editor. He was also a journalist, an author. He was also uh, the director of what was the Science Institute, which was in the early days, about 100 years ago, 1921, an effort uh, to educate the public on science. And so they would contribute articles and background information to the, all the news services. Uh, but he was also a noted and highly regarded, reputable chemist. He taught chemistry at the University of Wyoming. Now, according to Theodore Engstrom, who uh, was once the editor of the Christian Herald, it was um, Dr. Slauson who really contributed from a scientific point of view something that's absolutely amazing when we think about Scripture, uh, specifically in Genesis chapter 2, as we are going to be looking at the question, who or what are we in relation to God? He said, and I will paraphrase uh, Dr. Engstrom about Dr. Slauson, God formed man of the dust of the ground. Professor Slauson assures that these simple words are charged with the deepest scientific meaning. He says that the dust of the ground contains just 14 out of the 92 chemical elements known to science and that human flesh is composed of precisely those same 14 elements. English scientists from different parts of the Great Britain have confirmed uh, this not as a theory but as a fact, a recognized fact of chemical science. Therefore, loosely put, you and I, every human being on this planet, from Adam and Eve to you and me this morning here at Chunky Baptist Church, we are miracles of dust. Which allows us to ask the question, there are times in our life when we probably feel face down in the dirt, do we not? Are there times where you have felt insignificant? Are there times where you have felt uh, as if um, you are small and inadequate? Well, guess what? In those times, and they probably affect all of us at some point in our life, if you haven't had those op opportunities, hang on, it's coming. Remember that from God's point of view, you are a miracle of dust. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I'm talking about that is a, that is a beautiful thing, a miracle of dust. Or maybe you're one of those that uh, you are supremely self-confident. Uh, you are proud of who you are, what you are, what you have accomplished. You know, the old saying goes, it ain't bragging if you can do it, okay? Maybe that, maybe it applies to some of us. Let me assure you, life has a way of disabusing you and me of that notion pretty quick. Been there, done that, got the coffee mug, okay? I know what I'm talking about. But in the two extremes, we still continue to ask ourselves that question, what and who are we in relation to God? Now, a few months ago, if you remember, uh, we did a sermon series about who is God in relation to us. Well, we're flipping that uh, for the next few Sundays. And Scripture allows us to see and to know who and what we are in relation to God. And I find that uplifting, encouraging, and humbling. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 8, Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, a beautiful and poetic account of the creation of man. I believe it is a psalm that was written by King David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we, even if it were not King David, it is still inspired scripture, the song book of Israel, the prayer song. So hear the word of God. In verse 3 of chapter 8, well, Psalm chapter 8, the Bible says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man? That you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit or care for him. Again, I remind you, never ever forget on whatever scale of the spectrum you may be on from down in the dirt in the desert, so to speak, to uh, maybe on the lofty heights. Never, ever forget that you are a miracle of dust. Genesis 2-7, the Bible tells us, and the Lord God formed man, that is Adam specifically, humanity in general, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. 
and man became a living being. So to answer that question generally, uh, we've talked about we are a miracle of dust. Well, backing off that just a little bit to have a little bit bigger picture, we are God's creation. And I find that that is an awesome thing. We are not the product of just random chance. We're not the product of random chemicals coming together, so to speak, to pay homage to Dr. Slauson, but we are a miracle of God. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 8, verse 5, For you have made him a little lower than the angels. Now, the context of this is the creation of Adam. Then will come the creation of Eve. And then, of course, the ultimate fulfillment of this will be in the person of Jesus Christ. Son of God, 100% divine. Son of man, that is 100% human, with the, birth, the virgin birth as we celebrate in Christmas time. You and I plug into this somewhere in between. Stuart Briscoe has said, slightly lower than the angels is a whole lot better than slightly higher than the apes. So as we ask ourselves that question again, and I repeat it on purpose for emphasis sake, who and what are we in, in relation to God? Well, I would have you note that number one, we are his personal creation. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. Verse 5, let's look at what it meant then. God created him. Adam, we'll start with him, he created him up close and personal. Now in the six days of creation, the vast majority of what was created was God speaking and it became into existence. Okay, that is called fiat creation. That is to speak it, and there it is. That would be this morning if I were to say, let there be a cup of coffee au lait, and over here, let there be a plate of beignets, powdered sugar beignets. That is the uh, donut of choice in New Orleans. Okay, and they suddenly appeared, that would be fiat. That is the sheer force of will. Ex nihilo is Latin for out of nothing. So God, by sheer force of will, created something out of nothing, and it was perfect and complete in its creation, and that's amazing. But And he also said, and he saw and looked, and it was good, but you get to day six, something at the... All the other animals are being created, yes. I believe even the dinosaurs are created in that day six situation. But something unique happens. It says that God then creates man or Adam out of the very dirt or dust of the earth. God did this up close and personal. It's not. He could have very easily sat on the throne and said, let there be a human being, and it would have been perfect and complete just like that. But God personally got involved. He personally fashioned the human body. He brought it from being dirt or, or clay or mud into the human body that we see today. Only that's before sin had come in, obviously, that has affected things. And then he breathed into Adam the breath of life so that Adam is a living, breathing quote, creature, because the word Adam comes from the Hebrew word ha-adam, the earth creature, but something even better than just simply being, well, he's just another creature, he also gives Adam a spirit. He has the ability to relate to God in, in a personal relationship, something that not even the angels have the ability to do so, as I understand it. One expositor, Ellicott, says that God created or made Adam, and therefore humanity, little less than divine. This means that it is a high honor and a holy honor bestowed upon Adam and, of course, Eve, who's created from his rib a little bit later. Since she is flesh, uh, Adam says, she is flesh of my flesh and bone of my blood, bone, and therefore uh, she shall be called woman, for out of her comes man. She is the mother of all living. When we think about this personal creation of a personal God, up close and personal, the Bible reminds us in Psalm 100, verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. For we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. The language of the Old Testament here is of somebody taking uh, clay, if you will, and molding it, and pressing it, and squeezing it into the shape that the molder or the sculptor sees fit. But now, O oh Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, thou our potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. Isaiah 64, verse 8. Therefore, the psalm writer 
is praising God, poetically, yes, but he's praising God for the creation of humanity. We find other passages of scripture that says, behold, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, meaning not where ah, I'm scared. No, that's not what we're talking about, but rather the, the awe-inspiring situation that when you think about a human life, and I won't go into all the details of conception and gestation and all that. I will allow you to think for yourself on that, but I will say this. It is a miracle from start to finish, and it's a reminder that we are miracles of dust. Now, society, culture, and sadly even science would have us believe and accept that we are the product of evolution, that we are a highly evolved primate. Oh, we have intellect, yeah, and, and we have instinct, obviously, but we're just a, uh, just a extension of the animal kingdom. Top of the food chain, perhaps, but still just a creature. You know, I find that degrading and devaluing. And then there are those who are slightly more idealistic who says, well, hey guys, we're full of stardust. I had to scratch my head about that when I'm like, what? When I read that. And basically it's this, that back in ancient millennia, eons and eons ago, uh, the dust in, uh, you know, in the heavens or in, the, in outer space that coalesces into the planets and stars obviously forms this planet and therefore Earth is the <clears throat> source of our life and therefore we're all full of stardust. Now, that's slightly more idealistic, slightly more uplifting, I suppose, but still woefully inadequate because it tells me then that then the only importance of life, if you follow that train of reasoning, is that life here and now is what matters and nothing else. And that is certainly degrading. It is, it is depressing. It is fatalistic. Whereas when we consider ourselves that we are a miracle of dust, that God personally was involved in each person's creation. Yes, Adam and Eve with the physical act of creation, the forming from the dirt, but also human creation as we understand that concept today. And that's all I'll say about that. Obviously, we are a miracle of God. The Bible says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation 4.11, I like the King James. It says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You and I were created as a miracle of dust, personally created by God for a personal relationship with him. And I find that amazing because no other religion offers that. No other spirituality or philosophy of man offers that kind of hope, living or beyond. Amen? Amen. He existed before everything and holds everything together. Colossians 1.17. That means he's personally involved in your life. It's not a case of what God created man and then he walked away. We may feel that way sometimes. We may feel that God is oh so way distant and we're down here and he's way up there, but that's not the case. He is close to you in your very heart. The word is near you in your very heart and mouth. God is an up-close and personal God this morning who delights in you, who desires to have that relationship and fellowship with you. Because he, and he holds you together. He sustains you, literally, as well as spiritually, and all other things in between. And I find that absolutely amazing. Human life began as a thought, an intent in the mind and the heart of God. Humanity's creation, Adam and Eve and all the generations of humanity, even to this morning, is a deliberate, specific choice and action of Almighty God, not the design of, quote, nature, random chance, and, and chemicals working together. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Now that us, I believe, is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That image, I'm not suggesting that, that we look physically like Jesus Christ. I, I don't see long hair and beards, okay? Uh, there are some who would say that, but I'm not. But I do say that, at least in part, we have, we have personality. We have individuality. We have reason and intellect. We have emotion. We have that uh, creativity at, at some level. Now, some people are more creative than others. I get it, but I'm just saying in general terms. And we have uh, conscience and will. And so we have that ability to relate to God because God designed us that way as a personal creation. And as a result, we are 
in that image of God. It says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's found in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Human life, personally established by God, is expressed in two genders. There's no confusion here. There's no question mark in Scripture. Uh, there is a period at the end of the sentence. It is fact. It is practical for obvious purposes. It's also uh, purposeful. True manhood and masculinity, true womanhood and femininity finds its origin, finds its sustenance, finds its fulfillment and expression in Almighty God to the glory of Almighty God. So how do we connect the dots to Chunky Baptist Church? We have talked about some pretty broad, uh, try it again, broad strokes uh, theologically and, and um, scripturally. So how do we nail it down to where we are this morning? Every man... Every woman, every boy and girl, those sitting in this room and those outside the walls of this church are miracles of God, miracles of dust today. Each one of us created in the image of God. That means that there is a value and a, a dignity to our life. In the image of God, there is a purpose to our life. That is something that this world sorely needs to hear today, that you are deeply loved and God has made it so that you can find your identity and your completion in Him personally, your fulfillment in Him. Without Him, we're incomplete. But in Him, we are perfect. And in Him, we can be complete. That day is coming when we will be like Him. So on those times when we feel face down in the dirt, we just need to remember that we are miracles of dirt and look up to Jesus Christ and reach out to Him because He does not want us wallowing in the dirt but rather walking with him in the light. Lift up your heads to Jesus because you were personally created by a personal God for a personal relationship and fellowship with him each and every day of your life and for eternity to come. Chunky Baptist life, obviously, it can assault and it can abuse you. It can scare you and it can scar you, but it cannot rob you of the dignity and of the value that the Lord places on your life. No matter what you have done, no matter where you've come from, or what you've been through, or what you're doing even right now, no matter who and what you are, it cannot rob you of that because God has created you in the image of God. You are His personal creation. So too is the person next to you. So too is the person across the street. So too are the people that we desire to reach out to in Chunky uh, through our Family Fun Fest, through our youth camp, through our Vacation Bible School, through any ministry of this church. People made in the image of God. That is, there are people whom God loves dearly. He cherishes them. Do we love them? Do we love them with the same intensity and the same fervor of Almighty God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because the stakes are oh so high. The rewards are even greater. The fields ripe. So let us be praying, oh God, send us forth to reach out to those who have been created in your image, to share the good news of the gospel, to love them the way Jesus would love. So when you and I find ourselves maybe down in the dirt, Let's look up to Jesus. Then let us love one another and love others like Jesus. Psalm 139, 14. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, reminding us that there are no self-made men and women. Now, on the screen behind me is the image of two hands barely touching. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, symbols in that. It's actually if we were to show the larger screen, which we will not, uh, it's actually the painting by a sculptor. Uh, you would think that an artist painter would have actually done it, but no, a sculptor painted this, hence the anatomically more realistic look. It is by Michelangelo. It is in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, and Michelangelo painted this uh, sometime between the years 1508, 1512, if we were to show the larger image, you have God 
in, of course, a humanoid form or, or human form with a white, gray, flowing mane of hair reaching out with, as if the wind is in his face, reaching for our humanity. And you've got Adam kind of lounging on a, like, just lounging around, very laid back, very complacent, apparently lifting up the image of God the Father as he's reaching out. He's wearing a, a light-colored robe suggesting accessibility. He's not the forbidding, uh, foreboding entity that in some paintings that he has been portrayed to be, but rather uh, very urgent, wanting to reach out. And, of course, Adam has the same type of physical features that, that God does, only Adam looks a little bit younger, obviously, because Michelangelo portrayed God the Father as the Ancient of Days but a reminding that God is intimately involved in the creation of man, and therefore Adam is in the image of God. And if man is going to ever have the true spark of life, he needs the touch of God. If this church is to have the spark of life, then we need the, church, we need the touch of God. If our community is ever to have the, quote, spark of life in it, people who are created in the image of God but who are lost and do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, they're going to need the touch of God. And here's the great news on that. You and I are the hands, the feet, and the mouthpiece of Jesus today. So that brings us to our second final point. It's a personal creation, but it's what I call number two, a pertinent creation. A pertinent creation. Human life, yours, mine, it has a point and it has a plan. It is not just willy-nilly living it by the seat of your pants, just winging it, although it may feel that way sometimes. We can all probably say amen to that, but that's not how it is from God's point of view. Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8 says, And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Adam and Eve were created to have fellowship with God. Fellowship is not just, now I like fellowship, which is meet, greet, and eat, okay? Uh, chocolate chip cookies, coffee, awesome, okay? Um, that's, that's awesome, you know? But, and while that's good, that's not really fellowship. Fellowship is a partnership working together because of a shared personal relationship. God created Adam and Eve, and as implication, all humanity, to have that not just a relationship where you make heaven and miss hell. That's, that's good. I mean, we all want that. That's an amen moment. That's true. But to be able to work with God and, and to work alongside and, and to join God in the works that he has uh, for us, it's not just having companionship, but it is partnership. It's not some dictatorial dominion or domination of the planet, as some groups would have you think, but rather a custodial caretaking. It says we want to use everything to the glory of God. Whether it's our finances, then we will use it to the glory of God. If it's our physical possessions, we will use them to the glory of God. Or whatever else you want to add to that list, we do so to the glory of God. Adam demonstrated this by his care of the Garden of Eden. He named the animals that were presented to him. Yes, I know that God was preparing him to say, to say you need a helpmate. You need one who is comparable to you. And obviously all the animals of creation, I can just imagine a velociraptor coming by or, or Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, you know, yeah, most definitely not suitable for you, Adam. Although they were probably not meat eaters then, but that's a sermon for another time. But I can see when he does create Eve out of his rib and he says, you know, this is woman. And he says, obviously, awesome. This is blood of my blood. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he names her Eve. And together, for a time that we're not told in Scripture how long it may have lasted, that they worked and lived in tandem in worship and relationship to God, their creator, and God, their heavenly father. That desire, that purpose hasn't changed. Sin came in, yes, and it necessitated uh, God's divine plan of salvation, which he provided. He promised it in Genesis 3.15, by the way, and he provided what he promised. But we see that, uh, that caretaking situation going on. It reflects the love and grace and glory of God. And while sin, self, and Satan may have marred the image, Jesus Christ redeems it and gives it its fullest expression in your life and in my life and through him. So again, we connect the dots, hopefully, to Chunky Baptist Church. 
Again, we paint with broad brush strokes, you know, kind of like a Michelangelo here. But how does it relate to you? Because if it's not news that you can use, then it's no good. We're not a pet, and we're not a project. We are miracles of dust who God says, I have a purpose for you. Now, I can't boldly stand here and say, I know the purpose for each one of your life. I'm not a prophet in that regard. God has not given me that inside information, so to speak. But I do know our general purpose, and when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, that we are to, quote, fear God, meaning that reverence of Him, that respect of Him that comes from a love relationship with Him. That's what we are created for, so that if you are a doctor, then you are one for Jesus Christ. If you're a lawyer, you're one for Jesus Christ. Whatever job, whatever career, whatever profession you may be, or you may be retired, I get it, then even in that state, you do what you are, and you are what you do to the glory of God. Jesus, the Son of Man, is our ultimate fulfillment and gives us our ultimate purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created, crafted, molded in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk or live in them. Good works do not save you, but good works flow from your salvation experience. That is what the church is about, being a living demonstration to those around us. The Bible says, before I formed you in the... I can't talk. Try it again. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, set you apart. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This is God speaking to a younger Jeremiah, calling him to the ministry. Jeremiah 1.5. What is true there is true for you and me as well. As we apply this, as we close this, Chunky Baptist... Your life and my life, our life together is pertinent. There's purpose and meaning. And I'm not telling you something revelatory that you've never heard. I'm just merely reminding you, especially as we go through these days that challenge us on all fronts. And like a young Jeremiah, God has a plan for each and every one of you. Even if you have missed many opportunities along the way, the good news is God can redeem that. Well, preacher, I've messed up every opportunity. Okay, maybe so. And God can redeem that as well. He can redeem it. He can reclaim it. He can repurpose it and you because God still loves you. And all of it, all of it is in line with what he desires. There's nothing that, oh, well, you know, if you hadn't done that, Charles, I, I could have used you in this way. Well, there may be consequences and there may be situations where God allows us to experience consequences, but we're still under the grace of God, a personal creation that is dearly beloved to him. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And as God's creation, he recreates you and makes you suitable for him even now. It's not a one-time, one-chance offer, but a living, continuous, daily, maybe even hourly reality. Your life, its warts, its worries, its wins, and its wonders, they all work for his glory. John of Kronstadt, who was a bishop long time ago in Russia, said, Our wickedness shall not overpower the unspeakable goodness and mercy of God. Our dullness shall not overpower God's wisdom, nor our infirmity God's omnipotence. Isaiah 43, 21, as I close. The people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. You exist a miracle of dust saying how great is our God how awesome is our God how big is our God and there are people who desperately need to hear that who need to see their life in light of that so that they may have a living hope for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God Romans 8 19 while that's an end time situation but the end times also are part of our times we are those sons and daughters of God revealing the glories of God as living, breathing miracles of dust. Are you fulfilling your purpose today as a man, as a woman? When life puffs you up, it is the Lord who has made you. We remember that. When life gets you down, it is the Lord who uplifts you. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved 
and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Who are we in relation to God? We are his dearly beloved creation. Ultimately, a child. Ultimately, his, his servant. So lift up your head and look up to Jesus and give him the praise, all you who are living miracles of dust. But this morning, one way to do that may be that the Lord is putting upon your heart to trust him as Savior for the very first time. If that's the case, then let nothing hold you back. Come to this altar this morning and nail it down with Jesus Christ. Life is too short, eternity too long to have a I don't know. So I urge you and I implore you, come. There may be other decisions. The Lord may be desiring that you unite with this church as your church family so that together, as miracles of dust, we lift up Jesus Christ in this community. Won't you come this morning? Don't let anything hold you back. There may be some other commitment, some other decision. The altar is yours, my friend. You come as God leads you. Let us stand as we sing our hymn of invitation this morning.